You are listening to Unstoppable Mindset, the podcast where inclusion, diversity, and the unexpected meet. Love to say that. Anyway, welcome to another episode. Today, we get to chat with Sean Smith. Sean is the co well, is the founder of Financial, Dedicated Financial GBC. He's the CEO and he founded it back in 2015. Going to be interested to hear about that and get thoughts about how the world has changed in the last eight years with finances and all that. Money is still money, though. But anyway, um, we won't we'll worry about that right now. But Sean, I want to welcome you to Unstoppable Mindset, and I really appreciate you being here. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate you having me on the podcast. Well, I hope it will be fun, and I think we'll uh, we'll see what we can accomplish and what we can learn. Tell me a little bit about you, kind of the early Sean's, you know, back when you when you started as a person and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I would have what I think the world would typically consider to be the exact opposite of uh, your typical track to, you know, running a successful small business. Um, so grew up in the welfare system. I'm high school educated, uh, pretty rough upbringing. And it really wasn't until I was 22 when uh, I was able to get some good mentors in my life and kind of turn things in a more positive direction. Um, and even that now has been basically a 20 year, you know, process of, of learning and growing from that. So uh, I was raised, born and raised uh, in Minnesota, I spent a little time in Southern California and Oregon, but mostly all in Minnesota and uh, currently uh, married with a four children and uh yeah so minnesota you like the snow i love the winter uh i don't love how long it is in minnesota but yeah. <laughs> i'm blessed to have to travel for business pretty regularly so you know i get out enough to where it doesn't bug me so much yeah i i hear you we live in victorville california so we get a lot of the cold, we're up at about 2,850 feet above sea level, so it gets cold in the winter. It's the high desert, but uh, below all the mountains where the ski resorts are and so on. So we get all the cold, but we don't get the snow. Um, so I'm not sure where the fun is of that. And this past year, <laughs> with, with all the snow that everyone had um, here in California and the wonderful skiing that it was, we had two inches of snow one Saturday afternoon, so the kids didn't even get a snow day from school. Yeah, I actually got trapped out in a in a snowstorm in Park City this mm -hmm. last year at Park City, Utah, and spent three days trapped at Park City and snowboarding in waist-deep powder. It was uh, one of the most epic uh, times I've ever – If it was the most epic time I've ever had riding my snowboard in 30 years of riding a snowboard, so it was – it was pretty amazing. It, it was. It started right as I was driving over the pass to get into Park City, and it literally stopped snowing right as we were driving to the airport. So it was a pretty incredible time. Wow! So they did it just for you. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll take it however I can get it. But it was. It was truly amazing. It was, uh, it was one that me and my friends will never forget. That's for sure. So did you go off to college along the way? Did not. Uh, graduated high school from Spring Lake Park High School and uh, really was trying to find, I was supposed to go to college either to be a mechanic or I was supposed to go into the Marines. That was kind of the two options that were in front of me out of high school. And my dad is a Marine, my uncle's a Marine, and uh, several family mem members were Marines or Army. And at the time, I, I just... Um, didn't feel led to do that. And I was really into cars. So I was going to go to UTI to be an auto mechanic. And after interviewing auto mechanics and understanding their lifestyle, what they did for work and how much they enjoyed it or lack thereof, I decided I wanted to keep that as a hobby in my life versus, uh, you know, a career, which I thought was great advice to go and interview people before you go in a direction and make sure that their life is kind of bearing the fruit that you want to have. Um, and so uh, I ended up kind of trying out different jobs until I landed in some sales roles because I had friends that were making more money doing that, figured out I was okay at that. Uh, and then at 22, I started uh, really focusing on my own small business and built 
between 22 and 32, I built two separate uh, marketing companies, uh, both into the black. And then um, for various reasons, I ended up walking away from that, went back into corporate America, uh, into the financial services community, and ultimately found that to be toxic uh, as well. And really think corporate America is broken here, at least in the United States, because I can only speak from that experience. I haven't worked in, you know, Europe or Asia or anything like that. But um, kind of hit me across the head that the only way I was going to be able to do this was to do it differently, was to, to be an owner. And so I've been asking this, you know, I had people for the last five years asking me to start dedicated and. So I finally said, all right, I'm open to it. And then one thing led to another. The next thing you know, Dedicated was born. Tell me a little bit more about your thoughts regarding the, the the corporate America system being broken. I think that's true. I don't know whether it's for the same reasons as you, but what do you mean by it's broken? What do you think about that? Well, the two big points I typically touch on that from, from a high macro level is, one, I think that... Uh, corporations you know really do treat people as a number and they put profit before people and they put their own success before being significant to others and what happens in that then is that you have a jaded management structure with maybe a couple good eggs in there who are fighting a losing battle of doing the right thing over the bottom line and making money and when the shareholders and the owner's uh, profit become more more important uh, than uh, people being able to do well, not just financially, but between benefits and flexibility and the way they're treated and et cetera. So there's a whole equation there that's kind of broken. And um, yeah, so I think, you know, that's been my focus is to chase change what I'm chasing, focus on being significant to my team here and then to my clients and to, and to local and the global community, and then putting people before profit, which means, you know, dedicated, any business has to be profitable to remain in business, right? right. But the, the system of, of greed uh, here, at least again, in the United States um, and you see this play out in so many things like the Wells Fargo stuff where they're coming up with fake things or, you know, you've got, I, I my last company I worked for, I, I was a, a senior manager and I remember being told I had to cut people's bonus checks, you know, three days before the end of the month in their commission positions. And meanwhile, they got the owner walking around in the new vehicles he's driving and the new this house that he bought and this stuff. And it's like that, People are so fried on that uh, that environment, and you know it's leading to such a lack of purpose and purpose a purpose driven life in our culture today. And I think that's leading to a lot of mental health issues and relationship issues and health issues. Um, and when you spend this much time at work, you know if it's not healthy, it's toxic. And I yeah. and I, I believe that. So that's that's kind of my thoughts on that. Well, and it's kind of really what, what I think as well. So it turns out we align a lot. I had a chance some time ago to talk with someone who was the owner of a company. And we were talking about compensation and specifically what salespeople at the company made as opposed to what the president of the company made. And I made the observation that really good salespeople who outperform if you will, may very well make more than the the president of a company on any given year. And that should be okay. And he absolutely disagreed with that. He could not see how anyone should make more money than the president of the company. And I it, it wasn't a large company, but I was was amazed at that because you would want your salespeople to be incented to to sell. And if they happen to make more than you, why should that be a problem? But nevertheless, that was the attitude that he portrayed. Yeah, I, you know, I, I definitely know individuals that would share his perspective. Um, 
And again, I feel like those people are the same folks that are complaining how hard it is to uh, recruit new members to their team, to retain people, uh, have HR issues, and and things like that. And you know, I, I every single one of our commission folks, and we have several different uh, platforms within or verticals within dedicated that there are commissionable uh, team members. And every one of those is uncapped. I've had team members make multiple six figures on our team uh, that are high school educated, but they're hardworking uh, and doing a great job. And so I, I absolutely align with what you're saying. Um, you know, I and I, trust me that that has been discussed on the on the director level and above. Uh, you know, when we get into compensation and someone feels. Well, how is that person making more than me? Well, you you wanted to be in management. You wanted to serve others. But for our size company and where we're at and how well they're doing, I'm not going to rob from Peter to pay Paul. You're, you're in a market range for your salary. I just happen to choose to do no cap commissions on these people. So when they knock it out of the park, right, they get paid for doing that and, and – uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm aligned with you on that. Well, the other side of that is that when you have that kind of a situation where you have an uncapped commission and somebody really just blows everything away, um, in the long run, it's going to be a lot better for the company overall. And, and I would think in the long run, people in management, while they may not necessarily make as much on any given year, in the long run, they're going to be viewed as performing better because they help their teams perform better. And I think that's the other part about the, the whole team approach. What we also often don't do is recognize team performance nearly as, as well as we should. I know there have been companies where when a team really succeeded at doing something, who gets the recognition? The head of the team, even though the work may very well have mostly been done by other people on the team and the, the the person who was the director of the team really wasn't the one that brought the team together but they're still the director and they get a lot of recognition it's just we we do things in a very backward way sometimes yeah i would 100 percent agree with you that's uh that is uh consistently off i think again through all of corporate america and hence why our youth right that that sub 40 group especially is just flat out tired of it and getting jaded towards corporations uh so you know they're not wanting to put in any extra time or extra effort or lift an extra finger to help their neighbor or anything like that because why when the corporation is setting such a poor example of caring about them right why should they care and then I hear all this, you know, dedicated is not having a recruitment issue. We, in an industry, our industry averages a 50 to 100% turnover rate. It's a very tough job. We've averaged 22% year over year now for eight years. Uh, why? So we're half, less than half of the lower side average for our industry. Uh, so we're not struggling with those things, right? So... You know, that's, that just becomes a competitive advantage, I believe, just like a purpose-driven business is against other businesses in your space. So let the people who don't want to figure that out continue to struggle, and hopefully more businesses will will grow and continue to dominate the landscape that actually put their team members first. How do we get corporate America to change some of those things? I guess maybe another way to put it um, would be, in in your view, what what are the key things that one needs to have for success in, in whatever they do? And how do we then also, once you answer that, deal with getting corporate America to address it? Well, in the context of that question, I think I would, I would kind of go in a couple of different directions. But the first thing I'd say is your question reminds me of uh, there was a there's a story about a gentleman who went out and said, decided, I'm going to change the world. So he went out and tried to change the world and got disenfranchised because he couldn't change anything. So then he said, well, I'm going to change my country. And he tried to change his country and couldn't change. Said, okay, well, I'm going to change my state. 
tried to change his state, couldn't change anything. She's like, I'm gonna change my city, couldn't change anything. She's okay, I'm gonna change my family at least, couldn't change his family. So then he finally decided to change, work on changing himself. And when he could change himself, then all of a sudden he started to be able to influence his family for the better. And once he could influence his family, he learned how to influence his city and his state and his country. And eventually he changed the world. But so what that, you know, where it starts with is changing yourself. Mm -hmm. People, I think, especially in a corporation, a large corporation, struggle with leading from within. And it's, what am I going to be able to do here? And the question isn't what you can do there. It's a question is who can you become there? Because the better leader you become, the more compassionate leader, the more effective leader, the more loving leader, the more graceful leader, the more patient leader, the better servant leader you can become, the more your ability to influence. John Maxwell says, leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. So if you want to influence corporations, if you want to influence corporate, uh, corporate America, you first focus on, focus on yourself. And how that's played out and dedicated is I've spent 20 years of doing things in my industry radically different and, and personal growth and, and leading with love and, and servant leadership. And what that's led to now is literally two days ago, I go back from the Dominican taking a week to serve the poor down there. And one of the people on the team that I brought down there was actually the CEO of one of my competitors who now donates out of metric giving to feed my starving children and has joined me down in uh, some of the impoverished areas of uh, around the capital of the Dominican to serve the poor down there. Well, how did that happen? It didn't start by me going to him first. It started in me and working on me. And my approach to changing corporate America is I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing and I'm going to keep donating. I'm going to keep doing metric giving. I'm going to keep increasing team member benefits I'm going to keep shining that light. And I still believe that business is a competitive sport, right? Yeah. So it has become our competitive advantage because when, when you're doing things in the right way, you're going to not only retain clients and retain team members, but you're going to attract the right clients. You're going to attract the right business. You're going to retain it much longer. So you're spending less of your time trying to refill that funnel. You're just adding to it. And that's why dedicated uh, on average has grown by over 50% year over year with some years in the 100 to 200% growth range. And that so that became a competitive advantage. So I think the first part of changing America's fo focus is on the leaders changing themselves to the point where they can start influencing those around them because people see something in them and the way they lead in their team and, and what they do in their work product that they can respect and admire and, and want to duplicate. So I, that, but that's, that's my thoughts. Yeah. I um, know that when I hired salespeople, and I learned this a little bit over the time, but what I learned was that when I hired salespeople, the best thing that I could tell them is, I hired you, I hired you because I believe that you could do the job. You sold me on the fact that you could do the job. So my job isn't to boss you around. Rather, you and I need to learn to work together to see how I can add value to you to make you more successful. Um, in other words, how do we build a team together? And the And the reality is, it was different with every single person based on what their talents were and what they knew and what they could do and what they wanted to do. And some people really got it and we melded well together and the synergy was wonderful. But the people who didn't get it and who weren't really willing to look beyond themselves to grow didn't get it and didn't succeed. Yep. And... Yeah. The people that care more about the title over the ability to help others, uh, I, I really, sh I think we have too much positional leadership and not enough servant leadership, and that's really deteriorating the teams um, within our corporations. Uh, and that's, um, and people aren't being taught that. The, yeah. the stuff that I've been taught by the mentors. I mean, I tell people all the time the the, the cornerstones of my success are God's plan in my life great mentors and a great work ethic and the ability to work on myself and become better. Right. So, but we're not taught that we're not teaching that. Mm -hmm. 
we're not teaching them to be a servant leader or to uh, have mentorship that helps you with your blind spots or significant work ethic or overcoming challenges, things like that, right? We're, we're, so you, unless you have a great mentor or family member or friend, you know, you, you, you start to listen to what the world tells you, which is get a better title, get more pay or whatever, and you'll be successful. And then people find themselves miserable in that position and then thus make those around them miserable as well. So you mentioned him. Where does God fit into all of this? I mean, that's a cornerstone of everything for me. I mean, that yeah. was someone who was very much a non-believer my entire life. I really, uh, quite frankly, disdained uh, people of uh, any form of religion, uh, in particular, disdained Christians. Uh, so it was, it was definitely a Saul on the road to Damascus moment when I became one at 22. And, you know, someone who comes from that position of really feeling like, uh, if there's such a loving God, why would he allow so much bad stuff to happen to me and, and those I love and things like that um, to all of a sudden running a faith-based company and having that be the cornerstone of my family and everything that I do. Uh, it, it, there's a lot of seeking and I think finding comes to the seeker. If, if your mind isn't open and you're not willing to seek answers, you'll never find them. And if you're going into the information with with a bias of looking for what you want to hear to just affirm what you want to believe you'll stay stuck in that way of thinking forever and you know there was there was it, it, it's a process but ultimately the foundational verse for my life is ephesians three twenty, which you know, I, I translate that verse as it's his purpose it's his plan it's his power working with me and i'm going to give him the credit for all of it and anything that i do and in doing that, I've been able to make business decisions. I've been able to treat people with love and grace. I've been able to give in a way that is very uncommon. And I think the world needs more uncommon men uh, in leadership and uncommon women, too, to stand up and really serve and love others um, in, in, a, in an uncommon way in a world that's really challenging. So it's he, he kind of fits into everything for me. There's nothing he doesn't fit in into for me. And if there's anyone that knows me knows that I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to talk about him and I'm going to talk about helping those who are hurting in every conversation I have, no matter whether it's a barista at Starbucks or the CEO at a conference or a podcast with you, Michael, I'm going to be talking about the same, I'm going to beat the same drum everywhere I go. And I absolutely endorse that. I, I believe that that you know, it doesn't really matter what religion, in a sense, because it's the same God. And we all, if we go back and look at a lot of the bases and basics from different religions, we, we see the same basic teachings. And again, it gets back to one of those things that we try to take ownership of something that we shouldn't. Well, we also try to assert that we know for sure yeah. Something that none of us get to know until we get there, right? And so, you know, I'm very passionate about what you're saying. I don't, I have no idea whether there are several paths or one path. I just know a path that has worked, has been an amazingly positive thing in my life. It has been the greatest gift anyone has ever given me. Mm -hmm. And if you have a free gift that you can give away, I'm at least open discussing it when someone else is open and minded enough to discuss it. Um, and, you know, to, I, I was just on the DR and had this conversation. I brought several, I brought an atheist. I brought two other people that believe that are agnostic. Um, and I said, look at, you look at Jesus, he let the murderer into heaven on the cross after living an entirely, you know, a lot of his life in the wrong way, but he believed. So I just believe that, we're not going to know till we get there, but I would rather one put my hope in something positive that there is a there, that there is a heaven. And if I'm wrong, well, I was, there was going to be nothing anyway. So I'd rather live my life with hope one and two, clearly uh, God has demonstrated that he is willing to um, expose you to the full truth, even if it's at the end and allow you to make that decision where you want to be. So, whether you, you're Buddhist or Muslim or Christian or Jewish, I, I believe that 
when you when you get to that point when you're transitioning the full truth which i kind of believe in some ways like everybody's gonna kind of be wrong in some ways and everybody's kind of gonna be right in some ways you know i mean who knows right but you'll get full truth and in that you can choose where to go and that's where i choose to put my hope um and it really allows me to see the world in that way of which i have nothing but love for all people from any form of faith or people don't like faith but it gives me hope it makes me feel loved i feel like i have a real relationship with god i feel like i uh try to glorify a God that loves me and uh, blesses me and my family and those around me and allows me to go and be a blessing to the world where there's some really challenging stuff. And that's like where I just came from last week in the DR. So uh, definitely, uh, definitely a proponent of supporting people in any form of, of faith that yes. they walk in. That'll be a positive thing for them, provided it's grounded in love and respect for others. Just a couple of days ago, someone asked me, having known that I worked in the World Trade Center on September 11th and escaped with my guide dog, Roselle, they said, well, do you feel guilty at all that you survived and other people didn't? Which goes back to the whole survivor's guilt thing. And, and my response was, no, I don't feel guilty. I don't know what the, the plan was. I don't know all the details of everyone who didn't survive did they get told don't go to the building that day did they not who knows i know for me i never did feel that i got any message not to go into work that day we did have a thunderstorm that morning and we didn't usually have thunderstorms um that came right over our house at 12 30 at night so I suppose one could say, well, that was an omen for you, our message. Well, I didn't get the impression that it was. I and mean, frankly, I look for those kinds of things. But but the bottom line is that I only know that I did survive. And the issue was and is, what do I do with that? And I think that's the more important issue, which goes to what you're saying. The fact of the matter is that we all have some things we can control and a lot of things that we can't. And so I didn't have a lot of control over what was happening on September 11th. Oh, I could have decided not to evacuate as soon, but I felt this is the time to start down the stairs and did and made it out. But the other part of it is, okay, so I made some choices and, and did survive. But, you know, ultimately, most of that day, I didn't have necessarily a lot of control over it. had no control over those airplanes hitting the building and any number of other things. And all I can do is worry about the things that I can worry about and that I can actually have some control over. We spend so much time worrying about so many things that we don't necessarily have control over. And, and you know, people are always going, well, uh, and you, you mentioned it, and we, and we talked about you with uh, why does God let so many bad things happen? Well, um, if you look back on what did you learn from all those bad things, maybe they weren't quite so bad, but also uh, maybe you learned better to listen and you won't make those same kinds of judgments in the future. So it's all a question of where you go and how you deal with it, I think. Yeah, I'm with you. It's a bias to how you look at stuff. And that actually yeah, sure remind me, it's, it's still crazy for me to have met another person who was there uh, as my CFO was there, as we've discussed. So I think that's one thing where I, I think it'd be very interesting if you two did one together on your podcast from the standpoint of the time frame and the two different perspectives and where you were at. I think that'd be really interesting to see uh you know between the two of you but he's got a, he has a wild story just the same as you do um for that day and uh you know just anyone in my age bracket remembers exactly where they were uh that day and what's crazy about it is i had made the decision to not go into the marines and because of that i literally would i graduated in um uh, so when it changed 2000 so right so i graduated in high school in June of 2000. So before. I would have went off the boot, had just come out of boot, basically, been in my you know, first year and a half of service in the Marines, 
when that happened. And, and I went through a little bit of a form of guilt and not serving my country. I had several friends who did and, um, you know, in that, in that fashion. And I just had to believe that God had a plan for me and I uh, will go from there. Apologize if there's any background noise. We, we're, we're having a big tournament at the office and I think they just celebrated the, the winner of the tournament. So <laughs> what's, what's the tournament? It's like a bags tournament. Uh, you're throwing the bags in the hole. Uh, oh. so we did a whole bracketed tournament through the whole day, <laughs> you know, once a year and there was some prizes and everything. So, um, I was out in the second round, so I, I it's not my, uh, I, I was happy I made it in the second round last year. I was out in the first round. So I was like, Hey, well, at least I made it to the second round, but improvement. Uh, see next year yeah. and next year will be better. We'll go to the third round. Yeah. <laughs> I actually, did, um, maybe I missed it, but I didn't hear anything. So I think we're good, but you know, I think that it all comes down to choices. So after September 11th, and I'd love to meet your CFO and, and it'd be fun to have a discussion. So if you want to set that up, I think it would be great for us to, to, uh, to do something like that. But for me, I've always believed and it's become clearer since September 11th that, of course, we are the product of our choices. And I can trace my life back really far. And I can certainly trace how I got to the World Trade Center and the things that, that brought me there. Um, and very frankly, I can say that I don't regret any of the choices I've made. Some were tough, but I learned from them and was able to move on. And all of them eventually brought me to the World Trade Center. And then after September 11th, the very next day, actually, my wife Karen said, you know, you ought to call Guide Dogs for the Blind, the, uh, the organization where I've always gotten the Guide Dogs from. And I said, well, okay, why do you think I should? And she pointed out that there had been people from the school out here in California who had visited us in the World Trade Center, and they're eventually going to remember that you were there. And so I did call. And among other people, I spoke with the Director of Public Information, Joanne Ritter, and she said, gee, do you mind if I write a little story about you? And I wasn't really thinking, so I said, sure, go ahead. And then she said, you know, I'll bet it's going to be pretty visible. What TV show do you want to be on first? And I wasn't anywhere near where she was in terms of this mindset. So I just, oh, Larry King live. Um, and two days later on the 13th, I was invited to appear on Larry King live the next day. And that led to a lot of visibility that led to a lot of people wanting to interview us about interview me about the World Trade Center, but a lot of people then started calling and saying, we want you to come and talk to us and tell us what we should learn about September 11th and so on. And there I was confronted with a choice. <clears throat> and in reality, it ended up not being a hard choice because the company wasn't necessarily approaching what happened in the World Trade Center very well. They, they were just taking the mindset and taking the position. You got to get back selling. You can't you can't wait. You got to get back to selling. People weren't buying. They were attending five, six, and seven funerals a day. But the pressure from management was you got to get back to selling. And that just didn't sit right. So, as I tell people, I made the choice along the way to start selling life and philosophy rather than selling computer hardware right. because I also knew it would be a very rewarding thing to do. And then all the interviews with the media. As anybody in psychology will tell you, when you have an issue regarding yourself, talking about it always helps. Answering all the questions that people have, from the most inane questions to the most sophisticated, thought-provoking questions, really helped me move on from September 11th, which was great. Move on psychologically from, you know, what happened. I never did feel guilty, but still, you got to move on from something where your life was literally threatened. Mm -hmm forced you to process it and work through it right and so again it's all choices and uh, god was was for me certainly a part of it yeah, i'm with you on that yeah I, I feel the same way i look back and you know i feel like those steps were directed for sure and at the time they shouldn't feel that way sometimes but uh 
I, I I'm with you. I don't I don't regret it. And I, actually, the pain that I've been through and the trauma that I've been through in my life has become, in my opinion, my superpower. And it drives my love for others, my empathy, my compassion, and my desire to help those who are in challenging circumstances like I was when I was younger. So, um, yeah, without that, I, I don't know where I'd be whether I would have that, right? So it's interesting when you become older and wiser in a place where you literally start being thankful for your pain. It sure doesn't feel that way in the moment. But as you get past it in hindsight, you see the fruit that it ends up bearing in your life. Um, that's weird. I wouldn't wish it upon anyone, but I feel like God used it for the that which was meant to kill and destroy me. He used it for the good to help others. Uh, and so I don't regret that one bit. Of course, what you need to do is to have a conversation with God to see if you can get to round three next year. Get your own what? Get you to round three next year in the tournament. Yeah, yeah, among yeah, you know, have the serious discussions here. <laughs> I'm probably more likely to pay, pray over my golf game getting better, me shaving off a few strokes than I am <laughs> a bags tournament. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah, you gotta gotta do what works. Well, you know, um, but I but I do think that a lot of it is all about choice and a lot of self analysis. And you know, going back to corporate America, when we talk about the whole issue of profit and making money and so on. I wonder how many people who are just so fixated on the amount of money they earn and so on um, or that the company just has to be the end all from a profit standpoint. I wonder how many of those people really take time every day and think about what they're doing, think about their lives, just go back and um, do self examinations and see what's really going on with them. You know, people are always saying, well, I want to be happier. I'm not happy. And, and, you know, the question always comes back down to what's happy, right? And I think that becomes an issue that we um, also don't deal with very well in understanding what happiness really is. Uh, but when we're talking about just making money and so on, I wonder how much self-analysis and real introspection a lot of people do. I think next to none, I think the world is teaching them to just continue to stay busy so that they don't actually think about those things. Um, and that's sad. I think time in prayer and meditation daily is and to really look at your life and what's going on in it and reflect on it and, and is critical. And instead we fill it with as much noise as possible and uh, it drowns out uh, that inner voice, let alone the voice of God in your life. So that's unfortunately with social media and, and just uh, technology these days, especially it's, it's become really hard to get quiet and grow in that way. And that's a, it's a lost art for sure. Yeah. We, we don't listen to ourselves. We don't listen to our heart. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a serious problem because we don't learn that our instincts and our subconscious mind, which is which is really part of and talking with God, can communicate so much to us. My favorite example of that is playing Trivial Pursuit. How often when you're playing Trivial Pursuit do you get a question and an answer immediately pops into your head and you go, no, that can't be the answer. And you think about it and you give a different answer, but it turns out that the first answer that you thought of was the right answer. Mm -hmm. And it, it is just something we don't, we don't, listen to ourselves very well not nearly as much collectively as we should you're also making me realize i haven't played trivial pursuit here <laughs> haven't either <laughs> and it's been grew, grew up playing that game and now yeah like, <laughs> it's, it's a fun game I, I still love trivial pursuit and i uh i love watching jeopardy it's as close as i get to it but still trivial pursuit is, is a fun game I kept trying to get, I kept uh, trying to sign my father-in-law. He's a very, very wise man and a key mentor in my life. And uh, just the, the, the guy who knows every fun fact about everything. So I signed him up several times over years trying to get him on Jeopardy because I thought he'd crush it. He never, never made it. But uh, wicked smart guy is a professor at uh, University of Minnesota for 40 years and had a law and a finance degree from the U and from Purdue. So. Um, 
but that's a prime example. I didn't grow up with that. You know, my dad was a postal worker and a, and a Marine and my stepmom was a postal worker and my mother uh, grew up on uh, government assistance and child support. And mm -hmm. so that was what I had mentoring me on how to be successful in any area of my life, not just financially, but emotionally, mentally, spiritually, relationally. Right. And, um, Unfortunately, there was a big deficit in all those areas for the mentors I had growing up. So it really, really helps when you change who you're listening to and who you surround yourself with when it comes to taking advice. You strike me as someone who values mentors and having mentors in your life very much. How do you find good mentors and what kind of a difference do they make or do you think that they make or could make for other people in their lives? Outside of God, I honestly believe that mentorship and who you surround yourself will be the number one reason for being successful in anything. I actually just heard a story recently where it was um, a couple talking and they were deciding whether they were going to get married or not. And they said, say we get in a fight and you want and you want to vent this is the, 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 the male asking the female, what, you know, who, who are your three friends you would call? She lists the three friends. So who are you three friends? And he lists the three friends. He said, here's the difference. Your three friends, two of them are divorced. One is uh, single and living a going to the club lifestyle. And that's who you're going to call for advice when your marriage isn't going right. All three of, of the people I said I would call are people are who have been married for over 15 years and show fruit in the tree when it comes to their marriage. And so, who, you know, who do you think is more likely to give you advice? Because in that situation, my friends are actually going to defend you to me. Whereas in your friends are going to defend you and, and paint me to be the bad guy, right? So I think it's that way with, with mentorship is that you, you have to find the right mentors. And that takes a lot of work over a long period of time. Uh yeah, I said that the most uh, wealthiest man in the world was, was Solomon, and not because he, he had money and riches handed to him, but because he had wisdom, right? And someone who's in their 50s or 60s or 70s who has fruit on the tree, fruitful marriage, fruitful relationships, fruitful career, fruitful finances, is going to be able to give you much better advice and be a much more positive sounding board for your ideas uh, then your friend who uh, is not in any shape, form, way in the position in life you want to be in. And so, uh, you know, how I, I, my mentors are, so a key mentor I have is my father-in-law. That was lucky. Before that, I had other business mentors that I went to. Uh, I had to seek them out. I had to seek their time. Mentors are not going to chase you down. If a mentor's chasing you down, it's probably because they have something to gain by working with you. They have some angle, right? But a true mentor does not, there's, there's no benefit for them, whether you succeed or fail. And they have fruit on the tree in the area in which you're asking advice for them or sounding your ideas to them. And another mentor of mine is a spiritual mentor, is a grandmother who I went on my first trip to Haiti to serve the poor there uh, a decade ago. And over the last 10 years, I've cultivated a relationship with her where, where she's become like a mom to me. And she's actually one of the first people in this world that I ever felt unconditional love from. And uh, that, that took years to cultivate that relationship. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really big on therapy. Uh, dedicated pays for all co-pays. Uh, any mental health co-pays so that there's zero barrier to entry. So not only do you cover 75% of your medical, dental, and vision, but we cover any co-pays. And we're trying to move the company to 100% of mental, medical, dental, and vision here, uh, either this next cycle or the one after. And the only thing that would put a kink in that is we're doubling the size of the office again. So we got to factor that in as well. But yeah, so, uh, you know, that's like my head coach, right? So now I've got uh, a woman who is spiritually and relationally with her husband uh, as an amazing coach there. I've got a great business coach. My father-in-law has also been uh, married to my wife's mother for a long time and is a great coach there. Um, I've got business coaching. I've got financial coaches, right? And so those were all cultivated over years. And I had to pursue those relationships, not um, 
think they're going to come to me. And I never took them for granted. I held them with great respect. And I've never, the other thing I see is when people get great mentorship, at some point they reach a certain level of success. They also start to think they've made it. And the, what's easy for me with my background, I think it's a little harder for some people uh, is to realize that I always put myself at last. I always put myself to realize I can always grow and become better in that man, I'm okay at like a couple things. The rest of it, I got a lot of work to do. And to think that my uh, temporal worldly success is all on me is absolutely lunacy to me. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a, you surround yourself with great people, great friends. Um, and I, I'll go as far as to say is great family. You know, I, I've had to toxic parts of my family that are not part of my life. And I, love my family. And if that could ever change, I'm very open to mending that. But I, I'm very, very cautious with who I allow in my inner circle and with my time. And, and are they people who are building me up and or tearing, tearing me down? And are they people who are bearing the fruit in this world and their life that I'm looking for? Or are they people who are doing the exact opposite? Mm -hmm. Tell me a little about your company. Mm -hmm how it got named the way it did and, and exactly what you all do. So uh, Dedicated started as a dedicated commercial recovery. So it was basically a commercial loan portfolio management company so that we would do collections, repossessions, remarketing. We do that as a faith-based company with a focus on treating people well, both internally on our team and externally. At some point, we decided to change the name to better reflect both an expanded scope of services in the in the commercial uh, world, of really commercial, any form of commercial debt, commercial portfolio management, things like that. But also that we changed to being a general benefit corporation in the state of Minnesota that basically that your mission statement on down and every charter within your organization is set up for the benefit of others. Uh, in essence, putting others before the corporation's uh, success. And so we changed the dedicated financial GBC really to signify that we have an expanded offering as far as services go. So we do uh, commercial loan portfolio management and working capital, fintech, uh, a lot of fintech in the realm, in the commercial realm of, uh, of revenue-based finance. And we really handle all the customer service and internal workout uh, challenges. And then we transition that into a third party uh, commercial collection model and then repossession, remarketing, nationwide legal services. And then we can prep portfolios for debt sale. So kind of cradle to grave servicing of that back end, again, with a focus on um, having an amazing culture within our team where people are put first and taken care of. And then really protecting our client's brand. And we've been able to do what no, no one in our industry in the world has ever done. And I can say that with complete authority. We have over a thousand, actually, we have over 1,100 five star Google reviews that are all from small business that we serve that have given us a five star rating. And we hold a five star rating overall average as well. And all of those are organic, all of those are ones that we've asked for from small business and serving them in such a way that they felt compelled enough to give us a five-star review. And what the reward of that has been is that we continue to sign larger and larger clients who care a lot more than anything about protecting their brand and the small businesses they've served that they're being treated right. And no one in our, in our industry, they're all talking about how they're the hammer or they're going to do this or they're going to be that. And I work, I, you know, we, we work in a very dark industry. So we're really trying to bring some light to that and prove to the world that it, it can be done in a very positive way. Do you get attacked and picked on from some of the other folks in the industry? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I definitely think there's times when people try to slide some, some fake things in about us that get, get deleted off the internet because they're absolutely not true. And I think that um, because we're a faith-based company that that um, and we're not pushing that on anyone, you know, we have 
everyone under the sun working on dedicated. I could not be more proud of, of the folks on our team that are from the LGBTQ community, uh, that are Muslim, that are atheists. They are, everyone has a seat at the table at dedicated. They are loved, they are cared about, they're important, they're highly valued. And I would never tolerate anything less than that. Um, but uh, I would say that um, the other angle that people take on dedicated is that we're too soft on small businesses that have borrowed funds that are having a problem repaying back. Because a lot of the funding sources in the world and the people running that take it as a personal affront when someone doesn't pay them back. And they want to crush that that person, that business owner, or something like that. It, I just had this conversation about three weeks ago with with an owner of a funding company. I said, "Hey, do you want to be rich or do you want to be right?" Because yes, the person took out the money. Yes, they do owe you, but they're in a challenging circumstance. They're willing to work with us and do the right thing. Simply going and moving it to legal and suing them is only to make you feel better. And the likelihood of you making any additional money is low. In fact, you're going to have to give me more money for doing that, right? So I think sometimes that's another shot that people, oh, we're their faith-based company. They're, they're too soft on people. We're going to be the hammer. We're going to be aggressive. And anyone in my industry that's toting that they're aggressive, first of all, th those days are long gone. Second of all, you should care much more about being effective than aggressive because effective gets your money back and treats people in a human, in a good, humane way. Aggressive just makes you a jerk, makes people block your number and not deal with you anyways. So, you know, it's an outdated and antiquated practice. So, you know, we take a little bit of heat for different things, but um, it, the proof is in the pudding. Uh, we're, the, we're the largest in our space. Uh, and we've done that in, in eight years. Uh, we, I'm a 41 year old owner, uh, with, with, uh, you know, I mean, with, with no college education, but a heart for helping people and a heart for doing business the right way. And I, I look at how God's blessed the business that way. Uh, you know, and I have competitors that we've flown past, uh, because of that. Right. So clearly we're doing something right. And we're doing it in a way that feels good about the way we've succeeded. So, um, yeah, is that, I hope that answers that question. It, it does. Um, I A lot of thoughts come when I'm listening to you talk about all this. I remember years ago, I had a business, and we were going through a really tough time, and we had put a lot of things in the credit card bills. And one day I get a call from this guy at a bank, <clears throat> and he said, you know, you're way past due. I called you last week, and I said, we're working on it. We're going to get it, but we're working on it. And then he comes out with this thing. He said, you know, you really ought to be sensitive to those handicapped people who really have a problem and, and need our services rather than just being a guy that sits down there and is just talking your money and not paying us back when you can. And I just laughed at him and I said, why don't you come down here and sit with me and my guide dog and then tell me that same story? You know, um, it's, it's just crazy. People have it, is, it is crazy, and I think the industry needs to be regulated more. I think it's absolutely atrocious. I actually would go as far to say that it's evil the way – I mean, just using a small business owner as an example, and this really extends to everyone, but I want you – and you know this. When, when you're in a small business and you're struggling financially, that bleeds into every other aspect of your life. Yep. It bleeds into your marriage. It bleeds into your your interaction with your kids, your energy level, maybe how much you're giving to your church or to nonprofits or et cetera, right? It bleeds into everything. And you're down and you're struggling and you're fighting to call somebody up and basically start kicking them while they're down, threatening them, being overly aggressive is evil to me. And you would never do that if you came across someone on the side of the street who just tripped and fall and broken their arm. Hopefully, you'd be the good Samaritan that would help them up and help them get to the ambulance or get help or call 911, right? And yet, we have an entire industry that is allowed to just call people up and berate them and talk down to them and treat them as they are somehow less than us because they're going through a tough patch. I absolutely despise the way the industry is allowed to treat people. People often say, you know, we we pay for Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University for anyone on our team that would like it. It was a stepping stone when I was younger. I'm a big advocate, but Dave Ramsey hates 
any form of collector talks very down about the industry. Be like, well, how how do you do that when this guy vehemently hates everything that you do? I said, no, he vehemently hates my industry and what they do, not me. Because if he yeah. knew me and he knew the way you do it, he would he would he would hold us up as as someone in the industry shining a light. And I've actually uh, I've messaged him several times on their show, trying to get on their show to kind of be a contrarian for our industry and also be willing to completely agree with them. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's unfortunate and it's sad. Uh, the beautiful thing in that Michael is that AI is going to change everything. You're going to watch over the next five years. I wouldn't even say 10. I would say over the next five years, 80% of consumer collections is gone and done by AI. Mm -hmm. uh, and over the next 10 years, it'll be all, all but gone except for, you know, your handfuls of, of specialty reps for spe very specialized situation. But um, yeah, it's, it's on the horizon and that will, that will eliminate a lot of that over aggressive, unfortunate human behavior. And it will be uh, part of it will be technology, but part of it be the industry will be reaping what it's sown for the last 50 years, 60 years, 70 years. So that's, um, I, that's I do point. hope it will make, make for improvements that certainly is part of what needs to happen how do you mix god with business in a way that you can still deal with people who may have different beliefs than you see i, I love that i love that question because i believe that is being done so poorly in the world today and you see the chick-fil-a's and the hobby lobbies and these companies that here God has blessed them with a big business. And then you hear like the founder of Hobby Lobby saying that the number one thing that he learned is to never compromise. And uh, like we live in a world with an extremely diverse way of thinking and believing. And while I don't believe in compromising on my values, I know that a hundred percent of my team, not one of us are going to agree on every single issue. So how could I, how could I run a business where there isn't a seat at the table for everyone? Right. And that everyone that the first, and then here's what I'll just to speak for a Christian standpoint the hardest part about being a Christian, quite frankly, is other Christians, in my opinion. <laughs> and here, you, here you have it. I got a, a group, a massive group of people that follow uh, a, a faith, a, a, a system of faith in which when their savior was asked, what is the most important thing? He said to love God with all your heart and to love others. You know, really simple message. And yet I would go out on a limb and say eight out of 10 Christians that I know when I look at their life and I look at their interactions and I look at the way they do business or I look at the way they go to corporate America, whatever. And I would look for that being one of the most evident things in their life. I can't tell you that's what I would see. Right. Mm -hmm. I may see a hard worker. I may see someone who cares about being a good dad. I may see someone who has a, you know, a very respectable career or nice things or great travel. Uh, but when people know me and around me, I want them to know that first and foremost, I love God with every square inch of me and I love them the same. And that's, and that's when you have a foundation of that, that kind of love. Um, and that's the most important thing, not pushing a religion on anyone, not pushing a belief system on anyone, because not everyone can get down with, uh, you know, uh, God or Jesus or Muhammad or, or whatever it is. Right. But every face that kind of your point earlier in our conversation, it, it has a strong rooting in love for others. And, and you, when you create a corporation where that is, and you truly put people before profit, then everyone's welcome at the table, then a diverse group. When you talk about these things, we talk about all the time. I talk to my team all the time. We do a monthly scrum. And I just say, listen, we all know we don't agree on everything right but the one thing we can all agree on is that we want to feel like we're loved we're cared about we're important we're respected we're treated with respect so that's the foundation of dedicated the foundation isn't christianity the foundation is the actual doing of christianity without 
having to stuff the actual title down folks' throats, right? And uh, it just, it works. I mean, I, I'm, is it perfect? No. You, you, <laughs> from a Christian's perspective, we're all broken in some way, right? People are people. We all come in with our baggage and our challenges, and 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 we all have to go through this human experiences, uh, then, and often they're extremely hard. That's why as a corporation, I love to lean into those things and truly put people first. And um, yeah, I, I think that it's more about less talking and more doing of what you profess to be your faith and living that out in a, in, a, in a corporate way by actually exemplifying the values that you allegedly hold so dear in the book that you read. Yeah, right? the, the proof is really in the pudding of what you do, not right. what you say. Yeah. I think it was Tolstoy who once said that the biggest problem with Christianity is that most people don't practice it. Most Christians don't practice it, which is so very true. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was I was watching a debate between two well-known media figures, and they were talking about uh, how when this person had, cre had converted from Christianity to being a Muslim and how um, when they went to a Muslim country, they actually felt god and they felt uh a presence there whereas in, when they're in america they did and the other person said well i don't think america is really a christian nation anymore and i i hate to say it but when you look at uh who's running the country and you look at what the media is propping up and who hollywood's propping up and who we're being told to make role models for our kids these days um it's a, it sure makes a strong case uh, and that's why, again, it comes back to if we're going to change the world, it starts with us. It starts with less talking and more doing and and uh, loving others, especially when you disagree with them, especially when, you know, and I'll say one other thing in regards to your question is that I tell people, look, is what you're doing bearing fruit in your life? Because anyone can profess that their way of doing things is great. Oh, this is what you should be doing. or This is the way it should be. Great. Show me the fruit. Show me strong relationships. Show me hope and faith. Show me joy. Show me peace, contentment, right? Show me uh, strong uh, finances, right? If it's not bearing fruit, then I would challenge that maybe uh, you got a little bit of insanity going on where you're doing the same thing over and over again, expecting someday it's going to provide a different result, right? And uh, maybe you should check the fruit. And a lot mm -hmm. of so wisdom that's not taught these days. Definitely so. What are your plans for the future? Uh, it's an interesting question because how we all want to make plans, right? We all want to have goals and things we want to accomplish. And I find so much that we're always we talk about. What's your five year plan? Yeah. Or, you know, and what are the what are the next five moves you're going to do? And there's like a million Instagram and Facebook things, and all this stuff out there. And meanwhile, especially again, coming back to as a Christian, you know, I'm being told, don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow. We'll have its own troubles. Don't worry about yesterday because yesterday's already gone. Right. Um, my plans for the future are really to continue to stay focused on what God wants me to do in my life. And right now what I'm feeling led to do is hone in my focus on dedicated and both the company that we're building, the AI that we're building, the team that we're building and the amount of giving that we're doing and simplify my life uh god I, I heard the best quote just out on this trip while i was down in the dr where in every person that you interact with make it a goal imagine that they have written on their forehead make me feel important and i don't know about you but like i love it when someone makes me feel like i'm actually important to them like i matter sure and uh what a life to live where you could live in a way where every person you came in contact with, you made them feel loved and important and like they mattered. And uh, that's my plans for the future is continue to weave that into business, continue to weave that into uh, actually building an AI that takes all the data from dedicated and how we interact with people and how we treat people and puts that into a computer that actually leads with empathy and sympathy for people who are going through challenges and watch my kids grow up to coach baseball games and see, uh, you know, gymnastic meets and we'll go to golf matches and to go and serve 
locally, you know, and nationally and globally to those that are hurting, those are in need. And just to live, to shine my light in whatever I do and whatever God chooses to do with that, I'm going to let him figure that out. You know, I, yeah, I'm honored that you asked me to be on the podcast. I, I didn't see this out. I, I did, you know, and, and it's just like I'm, I'm on the board of a college, even though a D2 college, even though I've never went to college. And um, at the end of my four year term, I'll be honored with a, with being given an honorary degree, right? I didn't seek any of that out. I, that came to me. Um, not because I, I want that or that was a goal. I mean, it wasn't even on my radar to be a goal or something I wanted, you know, right? So, you know, I want to create the best for my kids. I want to create the best for my team at Dedicated. And I want to glorify God doing it. But I, you know, I feel led to, to move in this direction, and allow God to kind of fill in what happens next and to be thankful to have joy in, in, in the sun and to have joy in the rain. Uh, and, and that's, that's really, uh, that's brought me a lot of peace, uh, being focused on being internally joyful and peaceful, peaceful rather than just trying to f- fill temporary happiness and then to get to the next thing, to get to the next thing, to get to the next thing. So. That would be my focus, and you never know where things will lead from there, but I know if I'm going to be able to change the world, it's going to start with me, so that's where I'm going to stay focused is on me. And let life be an adventure. There's nothing wrong with that. Oh, I love the adventure. Yeah. I, I see this with so many business owners where they're so fo- – they have destination disease, right? When I get there, then I'm going to be happy. When I get there, I'm going to give back to others. When I get there, I'm going to spend more time with my wife and kids. And man, I, I I just try my hardest to say, you got to put yourself in a position to enjoy the journey, enjoy the adventure. And if you're not, you need to change what you're chasing. Start chasing being significant to others. Start chasing putting people first, and watch that joy bucket just fill and fill and fill, um, and you'll experience a totally different level of peace and contentment that the world. And it's things and your next goal and your next notoriety or award will never satisfy like uh, that level of joy, peace. You know, when you can do something for someone else that they can never repay you for, a level of joy that comes from that trumps anything you'll ever do in business or any, yeah. any award or anything. So amen to that. I'm with you. Well, I want to really thank you for all your time of being here today. If people want to reach out, maybe meet you or get to know you better or seek out any of the services from the company, how do they do that? Uh, you can email me at Sean at dedicated GBC.com. You can go on our website, uh, dedicated GBC.com. You can follow me. I'm very active on LinkedIn, especially, uh, I, again, my, my calling, my passion, I believe business has the greatest opportunity to change the world. We're taking steps to prove it. That's actually the mission statement of the company. And so um, I do public speaking events. I'm, I'm, I do mentorship. Uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily charge for. Uh, and I'm, if I can serve anyone in any way, uh, as long as I'm being led to do that, I'm happy to do that. Um, so uh, I'm sure you can put a link in the description below, but you can check us yeah. out on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, website, uh, or reach out to me directly or, or look up dedicated financial GVC, check out our website, reach out, uh, me and my team are happy to serve you in any way we can. And that's as good as it ever can get. And I certainly appreciate your time and your wisdom today. And I hope that the people who are listening to us do as well. So I want to thank you and thank you all for listening. Love to hear your thoughts about our podcast today. And uh, about all of our podcasts, feel free to email me at Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I, at Accessibe, A-C-C-E-S-S-I-B-E dot com, or go to our website, www.michaelhingson, Hingson is H-I-N-G-S-O-N dot com slash podcast. But wherever you're listening, I would really appreciate it if you give us a five-star review. We value that. But I do want to hear from you. We value your, your thoughts and your opinions and your comments. And for all of you, and Sean, of course, you, if you know anyone else who you think ought to be a guest, I'd love to meet your CFO. Um, 
please let us know. We're always looking for people who want to come on Unstoppable Mindset and show us all that we can be more unstoppable than we thought. So just once again, Sean, I want to thank you for being here and thanking you for spending the time with us today. Yeah, thank you, Mike. I'm honored uh, that you asked me to, and uh, I look forward to connecting you with Scott and, and, and many others. So uh, thank you, and, uh, and I pray that God blesses you as well.